Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Trudy Mwanga. I am your moderator for this session, the Africa Green Building uh, webinar series number five, case studies from around Africa. Um, I'm an advocate and uh, practitioner in sustainability. I've been uh, involved with sustainable development and uh, have a particular interest in climate change and the built environment, how they impact each other and how we can align what is done in respect of both to uh, meet our uh, nationally determined sustainable development goals. With us today are um, a panel of speakers that are really very, very um, specialized in these areas and I I will introduce them to you. Um, Tutsi, architect and founder of eConsult, who also happens to be the presidential advisor in Egypt. Sarah, will you join us? Hi, Sarah. Right. Um, we also have Tony Lee. Len, Executive Chair at, at uh, Green Building Council, Mauritius. Would you care to join us, Tony? Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, Tony. Good morning. Good afternoon. We have Yuta Burns Mumbi, Director and Principal Ecocentric in South Africa. Hi, Yuta. Sorry. I need to get rid of this. There we go. Um, awesome, everyone. Yes. Right. Um, if you just give me a minute. Who else? Have I missed out somebody? No. Um, and we will just if you give me a moment. Okay. Basically, our agenda is I'm going to. We, we, we have um, a brief introduction with regards to the speakers. We'll run a short poll, then they will run us through their um, respective projects. So um, if you just give me a moment, we shall um, ask you to please let us know a bit about yourselves. We'd like to know who has joined us today, and in particular, We'd like to know a bit about your level of understanding of green buildings. So if you can just take the poll and uh, the results will be delivered to us from somebody else. Um, just select one of the, the items listed. Are you an expert in green buildings? I, do you have some understanding on the subject, but not an expert? Do you have entry level knowledge about green buildings or, you know, where do you hear about the subject and uh, how do you feel, or, you know, would you like to know more about it? Okay. Right, the polls are back, the results are back, and by and large, we have, um, oh, a good turnout. Basically, you've got 49% of people have actually some understanding of the subject, but are not experts. 24% um, have a, are experts in green buildings. Some 22% uh, claim entry-level knowledge, and 5% are here to hear more and learn more. So that's a wonderful turnout. Okay, now that we've got to know who we've got, 
in our audience, I can better introduce our speakers and tell you a bit more about their specializations and their areas of particular interest. Um, I'm going to have to read this because they are truly um, wonderful people in their particular fields. So I'll start with Sarah. Sarah Albertusi is a founder of eConsult, as I said, and uh, Egypt President Special Advisor. She is, Sarah is a sustainable building consultant and architect and the founder of eConsult. eConsult is an e award-winning green building consultancy delivering full scope design, build, audit, and sustainability strategy services. Sarah is an alumnus of Cambridge University and is also an advisor, as I said, to the president of Egypt. So thank you very much for joining us, Sarah. Thank you very much for giving us your time. We truly appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, thank you. Yuta is up next. Um, Yuta is a sustainable building consultant and founder of Ecocentric, as I mentioned earlier. As an entrepreneur, she has a professional background in environmental and develop developmental uh, economics and green building strategies. Ecocentric is a boutique sustainable building consultancy in South Africa with a focus on um, LEED and green star green building certifications across the continent. Um, Welcome, Uta. Thank you very much. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm glad to be hearing more about it because she's, she's working on a project actually in Uganda. So we're very happy to have her here. Um, Tony, <coughs> good to see you again. And uh, let's get to your details. Um, Tony is a sustainable building consultant and partner of Ecosis. Um, Ecosis is a specialized in sustainability consultancy and social impact strategies in the Indian Ocean Islands. Tony is also an expert for the United for Smart Sustainable Cities, uh, a UN initiative coordinated um, by ITU and UNECE, and is supported by the UN Environment, UNFCC, and UN Habitat. Thank you very much for joining us, Tony. Right. Thank you. Right. Um, I should ask you all actually at this point to really delve into the projects that you you're going to introduce to us and to explain to us what makes them special and makes them particularly um, appealing as sustainable um development sustainable construction um showcases so i'll start with sarah could you please tell us a bit about your project sure hi everyone um, so the project that i'm going to be focusing on is a really challenging project that we had if we can step right into the slides, please, uh, Trudy. I think, yeah. So this is a um, an organic uh, producer. It's a private sector client uh, that came to us and asked us to have a complete campus in the middle of the Western desert. Um, the village is uh, over just a little over an acre. Um, it's two acres, the plot of land, 40% uh, of it is built up area. And uh, the challenge, we had three different challenges, which I will talk about. Um, it's comprised of about 12 buildings um, in, in the area. So you have um, labor's accommodation, engineer's accommodation, uh, you have an eco-lodge guest house, you have components for a, um, social outdoor area, um, a community center, a prayer area, clinics, etc., a laboratory and a lecture hall. So there's a lot going on with different activities in, in that one project. Um, at that point, this is an off-grid community and off-grid means that there is no, it's not connected to any grid that supplies energy. So this was one thing that we had in mind, which was not on the brief. Um, and another thing that was very interesting, so we need a low energy uh, development in the desert. We need to use as little material as possible. It should not produce waste. Um, and also you are dealing in conditions where there's very polar uh, climatic conditions in the specific area. So it gets extremely hot and then it gets much cooler during the day in one day. And then it gets 
extremely hot during the season as well and then freezing cold temperatures with a little bit of flash floods every now and then so you're dealing with challenging elements it's quite far the infrastructure to get there is very tricky um also just to add you know more ingredients to the mix it's also not very connected in terms of monitoring and um, you know it's not connected to uh, the phone grid either so it was very remote in that sense um can we move to the next slide yeah so one of the things that uh, and i particularly chose this image is that the amount of building that we wanted to build around the area was we wanted it to keep it as little as possible so you always have a feeling that the building itself is very peripheral the building is the gate it's multifunctional it doesn't sort of it's not enclosed and a gated community within the desert so it's looking very outward and there are bits and pieces of it um, that actually do that multifunction itself and that's the facade of the entrance next please Yeah, and on the inside, it's it's that feeling again where you just have a very small building um, and it's ventilated from all sides. That's the, the benefit of having that. We used very, very little um, greenery and planting. Um, the project itself was set to measure uh, its operational uh, aspect of it, so it's constantly monitored as well. Um, and it's entirely powered by solar energy at the moment um all of the all of the construction material have been reused again within the site and on the site um and then we'll delve a little bit more into into uh, the particulars of the projects to deal with specific challenges Excellent. thank you Trudy. thank you so much thank you very much for that um if i may just ask uh basically what did you have to do to 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 convince your Actually, we'll maybe we'll touch on that later. We'll look at um, the um, UTAS project. Are we going to Utah? Are we going to Tony? Montresor. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, that's the um, project in Mauritius. Uh, UTAS project uh, Tala. Great to see of architecture almost in the desert, uh, very good project. Um, the project I'm uh, looking, uh, I'm going to talk to you about is the smart city project uh, that we worked on. Um, our, our company, the sort of greenery council that um, existed. And um, we do have some pictures that I just, I'm sorry, I thought we could only use one slide. <laughs> so I'll have more pictures. But specifically, this is a project on uh, 480 hectares, um, which uh, is uh, with this water the sewer case preservation. Um, we've, uh, no, 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 this one. Is it uh, just one slide? Can you add it back? Yeah. We will we sugar the sugar. Uh, we didn't have any more protection to require. So in Mauritius, what happened is uh, a lot of uh, sugar cane preservation has been changed to different uh, uh, putting value to different uh, sugarcane fields. It was also uh, different uh, agriculture, like planting instead of mono mono mon mon crop to have some different uh, vegetables, etc. But a lot of it was around uh, property development. So, more is one of uh, Sorry, Tony, could I just interject a moment? Um, is there any way you could just maybe slightly adjust your audio so that we can more clearly hear what you're, you're saying? Because I'm sure a lot of people would really like to know the details that you're going through, but we're having some difficulty hearing you. Um, can you hear me? Yes, far better. I'm moving to the mic of... Uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Maybe it was my Bluetooth. Is it better? Yes, infinitely better. Okay, sorry about that. Yes, so Montrezor. Montrezor is um, in 
it's a sugar estate. Uh, a lot of sugar estate change the sugarcane fields into properties um, because obviously there's more value in uh, property development. Um, so this is a master plan that we worked on. It's a project on 480 hectares, in case you didn't hear me earlier. It's got different components. And um, strangely enough, uh, in Mauritius, around the airport, there, there isn't much um, light, light industrial that we see in most um, um, airports around the world. So uh, the first phase of, uh, of the project is a hotel, which has been built, a Holiday Inn. And um, then there's also the pre-port um, compound that they start, started on. It also, at one stage, the, the, um, it was in an old sugar factory, which was supposed to be renovated into a film production uh, for Mauritius. And um, it's got a lot uh, of uh, residential also component, a high street. And on your right hand side, actually, you have uh, the beach, the sea. So yeah, it's, it is a, a great project of changing just plain sugarcane field into a whole new city um, in Mauritius. So this is basically the project um, uh, that uh, was going to, I'm going to present on and talk to you about, about uh, the different processes in this project. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that. Um, We'll go straight into Uta, Uta's project, which is MasterCard Legal Office. So thank you very much, Uta. Okay, right. Um, I feel quite um, small right now because you, you know, my the other speakers have been talking about cities and villages, and we are just looking at a tiny, tiny uh, 450 square meter office uh, fit out, uh, which we assisted uh, MasterCard achieving a Green Star rating for. Um, the, um, the project, uh, MasterCard engaged us fairly early on in the early design stages. Um, work, we worked very closely with, um, with, the, with the project teams. Um, the design team, interestingly, was sitting in Dubai, the, obviously the client in, um, in New York, um, and then the project was partially managed and out of Nigeria. And then with us as green building consultants sitting um, in Johannesburg. So the, um, the, this was... Uh, that's pretty, it is, it's, it's a very standard kind of, I think in a way, very standard office fit out, um, but with a very clear target of achieving a green rating. Um, and uh, yeah, we, I think some of, I'm going to talk a little bit more about what, um, what the green aspects were, but I think one of the main uh, things for us was that it was, it was a fairly straightforward project in many ways from a design perspective. Um, the, uh, the one big element um, is, uh, um, and that's something I actually want to talk, we'll talk about a little bit later, is all furniture and fit out components were actually imported, um, which was quite a, um, I think there were quite a few opportunities possibly generally missed in this project, um, but, uh, but which obviously helped us um, getting a four-star rating fairly, fairly easily. Um, the one thing, and this is, there's really not very much to say about this project other than what we've got on the screen at the moment. The, like a lot of the other projects, um, this was uh, this project we started in um, sometime mid last year, mid 2019, was supposed to have been concluded by the beginning of this year. And then COVID, um, uh, COVID also then drew, you know, basically crossed out any kind of any timelines and we I think the the project is now finally complete but we had we also dealt with a lot of delays um, contracts contractors couldn't go back to site because everything was effectively closed um, so the so this is just just very short really in, in a nutshell so I give I, I'd rather give more time to those who have like these big cities to describe and the big um, and, and the villages so but I talk about no, other I, stuff doesn't that's it I'm Basically, the, 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 the range of uh, projects being shown really are all representative of the challenges and opportunities that exist within the building space. So I think there's no one that will prioritize <laughs> over the other, and they each are as valid as each other. So thank you all for your time and for your contributions. Um, I will now go to the questions, really, to interrogate a bit more what you had to do, the process that you engaged in to get to achieve whatever you, 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 know, you set out to do. First and foremost, um, 
working with your clients, how did you convince the owners to go green? Um, or were they already there or did you have to convince them? If so, how? Um, I'll throw that question to Sarah first. Yes, hi. Actually, we were lucky because our client was um, our client was working towards a partnership for the long term. They were reevaluating the sustainability portfolio, uh, so they they produce and export um, organic tea. So already, and um, you know, they know the certification processes, they know the challenges, etc. So convincing them was was more about to undertake rather than doing a small tiny project to actually transform the main asset into uh, a green building um now the, the strange thing is that they have conceptions about green buildings and that is something that you know they might have the sustainability portfolio very clearly laid out in within the company but their understanding of the green buildings needed a little bit of work first of all we're talking about, um, you know, this, the aesthetics of it. Um, they would envision, you know, um, uh, mud uh, huts, uh, sort of things that are not very durable to harsh conditions, um, uh, local, like uh, small kind of in installations rather than something that um, we were building to, to last. So we needed to get that uh, cleared out. And then the second thing was, is that um, convincing them that a green building is n beyond just the architecture and then it's turnkey. Actually, what makes a green building green is the way it works. It works with the resources that it has and it works for the people that are in it. So you're creating a longevity there of the purpose of the building that that uh, that should actually be lay laid out, you know, seeing the bigger picture, as I said. Um, and assessing the project beyond the brief, and then once you once you do that, you get to develop a brief that is more people centric as well. That tells you how people move within and how they feel inside the spaces, and then you start developing a program for that that functions. Um, and also to quantify, like one of the problems that 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 was there very clearly within this extreme heat is that, for instance, this this the, the owner of the farm has a problem retaining labor. How can I quantify that and create that into coming into the brief of an architecture uh, company? It's to see how to make people comfortable so that you can you can create an atmosphere for them where they, as the beneficiaries of that um, environment, uh, re receive receive that. And then you customize the solutions because it's not one size fit all, especially for instance, in Egypt, what goes on in the North and how you build in the North is not exactly the same way as in other areas. And we as the consultant convince them that if you gather this knowledge and if you approach the project from three different paradigms or four, so uh, we conducted a training for the decision makers. You know, we really took them through, like you conducted a poll so you can know the language that we're that we need to address the issue with and we talked about design which is pretty straightforward operations the integration of technology and then the human behavior so that they are able to quantify and qualify in their assessment of the building beyond the convention you know the budget uh, program and squeeze it all into a plan so we had a very technical back end to this uh, where we were working on capacity building for the users, for the management, you know, really telling them about the challenges of sustainability. And also we conducted, I wouldn't call it training, but sort of inclusive sessions with the local tribe um, living around in that area of the Western desert. And it's this is an attitude that I think really helped us because it ended up that we were not teaching, we were actually learning and integrating this into our design. The second one was to actually really monitor um, how the project was implemented and the construction, uh, construction phase, and also integrate um, knowledge of what's going on in the policy. So their concern about the costs was um, pretty much um, diluted when, when we started localizing the material uses. This is number one. So we used local material, 
we used um, uh, local know-how, we hired local labor, therefore cutting the transportation um, issues, which are very expensive because this is quite remote. At some point, we were actually monitoring the construction site via Google Earth because it's very difficult to get there, 450 kilometers, and you don't have mobile phones. Um, and we didn't want to stretch out this. At the same time, by convincing them that the building should be powered using solar energy and working how much that would become and when it would become CO2 neutral, it helped them to see the lifespan of the building and assess it versus having a conventional diesel generated um, kind of building. So all of these conditions, I haven't actually spoken about the architecture itself. I've spoken about contextualizing the project so you can make use of all the resources. And then we aligned all of the project and what we were doing to make them see where something like this would fall in the SDGs and their sustainable development agenda as a company. So the one intention of the project ended up serving various other aspects where they consolidated the costs of doing these small little projects into one. Um, and that worked out very well. So it's just a question of zooming out, um, you know, shaking our heads, changing paradigms and mindsets and coming in. She says, just as much of but thank you very much. That is actually really, really good. And uh, I look forward to hearing from uh, Tony on how you managed to convince your uh, clients or owners to go green, or did they not need any convincing at all? Um, yeah, we needed some a little push. Uh, the client, our client, is a big uh, sugar estate here in Mauritius, and they also at the time um, rebranded into like some sort of innovative uh, uh, company because they do energy also. We do biomass uh, energy production, um, we do ethanol also, so yeah. And um, in their actual uh, policy, and uh, um, I think it was their mission statement, uh, it was quite clear that um, green was was uh, something, and sustainability were, were two big aspects of their uh, ethos. So I discussed with a sustainability manager uh, of a group, and um, also we yeah, have this project also is a Briam community certified project. So this was also a, a, a value proposition for them because it is actually the first um, neighborhood development sustainable communities uh, project in the southern hemisphere actually, not let alone in Africa. So that was very attractive to them to, to, to go green. But I think this is not uh, what pushed them to do that. It was the smart city scheme that the government actually put forward to help exactly the big landowners like sugar states, etc., to develop their land. And this included a tax free on all the projects, uh, property development projects in the, in the smart city uh, for eight years. So you didn't have to pay tax for all eight years on your rental or on your sales and your profit. So there's been waiving of land transfer tax, uh, land conversion tax also um, was removed. And uh, there were lots of perks, basically, lots of fiscal incentives. Um, like the, the tax, uh, value added tax also were waived. So it was a really good scheme for having these big land owners to, to, to think about doing something which is more sustainable and smart rather than just doing any type of property development. So can I just Thanks. ask you again, to, um, very quickly, you, you just run through the, the motivations and talked about fiscal incentives that was were from from is that at government levels policy at what level were the incentives yeah. uh, incentives actually on government level it's uh, national government so okay. they, they, it was great yeah because a lot of these landowners they had already most of land because they big landowners but then they were forced to relook at the master plan to be able to benefit from the scheme 
and there were quite a few criteria that were very uh, prevalent that made the existing master plan um, uh, to be reworked into something more sustainable and smart uh, around resources, uh, energy, water uses, around use of technology also. Yeah, there were quite a few criteria to abide by to get the uh, fiscal incentive. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for that. Um, Yusha, you want to run us through right. the okay. of your client? Yeah, I'm actually going to really get to what I'm realizing my small projects. We really have to get to the nuts and bolts of really what, what it meant on the ground to not so much actually convincing the client to go green because MasterCard as a global client for them yes. having green building certification in particular and of course we were there as the green building consultants for certification this is actually part of their global sustainability strategy so there was no convincing to do this was not about the client what it was actually and this is really I think where which was an I this was not our first project in Nigeria this is our second project but again you know it's kind of um, embedded a lot of the um, the work that that we're doing um, that we can do remotely is actually getting trying to get to that point where we can get consistent buy-in in particular from the local teams the local mechanical engineer um, mechanical electrical and plumbing teams the construction teams and that was actually quite challenging because one of the reasons was you know for this particular contractor this was their very first green building project this is this is a big thing and I, I know sarah you talked about early on is about perception what is actually what is a green building and what is what does it mean and the um the and i think there was a lot of work that had to be done from our side um convince them that this is um it is worthwhile kind of going back to first principles to say why we're doing this um and why it's important so we had issued um right up front uh, something we call the um the the owner's project requirements which is something that's really important that something that's for us we do on all our projects which kind of um builds the sustainability requirements of the project for all the various disciplines into one overall document then with various sections which are very very specific we targeted at the various disciplines and this was quite a this was in itself, I mean, we had issued this and we went through it, but regardless, because there was, I think there was a lot of uncertainty on the project team side, exactly how to meet those 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 uh, those, those requirements. One of the things, you know, something quite common, um, and this, this is not uh, this is not unusual in any jurisdiction, uh, whether it's in on in in South Africa, it's it was in Nigeria, or even for that matter in in in, in the U.S., is waste management. You know, waste construction, waste management is a really, really big deal. You know, for 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 many reasons. One, of course, you know, there's, you know, that's it's, you know, let's not even talk about landfill. But let's talk about um, in, in, in embodied carbon, in and 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 avoidance of, of of waste. So, actually, getting getting the contractors to to even provide us, because of course, from a green building perspective, we need to document that, and to even get that kind of get the process in place that will actually me, will not just be a tick on a on a document, but will really be meaningful from a uh, from a process and output perspective. Actually, getting this from from contractors was quite complex at times. The other thing, of course, getting the documentation that we need and which we need as green building consultants to um, to ultimately document the compliance. That was also sometimes quite a um, quite a uh, quite a challenge. But I think this is sort of having. So this is really more has been more our um, this was more our experience with. Uh, not convincing the client, but actually convincing the 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 project team on site and on the ground to uh, to to come along with us, which has worked in the end, you know. But it's, it was, and but I hope we're just hoping that the next project will be a little bit easier overall as it gets as as the principles are getting embedded, especially in those smaller projects, which of course they're more a lot more smaller projects than 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 a lot of these very large projects. So it's from my side. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. I appreciate that. Sorry, we seem to have gone off. But I think that same question, if we look at, because um, you started delving into the weeds of the, um, you know, the, the reasons and the reasoning. So if I could look at the issue of which green concepts and solutions were applied, and that question can go to Sarah also to delve into and give us some greater detail. If you can go to the first slide, I mean, um, 
having the uh, contextual challenges in there of heat and cold. So um, we went through three um, main pathways. The first one was the energy saving because the energy there is off grid. So this was one of the things as we were developing the brief. The second one was water and we do have water scarcity and the water that is pumped in these um, remote areas is quite, um, it needs treatment and desalination at any point. And of course, we had the third one, which is habitat, you know, saving on materials. If something is not doing anything, it really shouldn't be there. And getting that mindset as architects, because here we're not, we're not, we're not the consultant, we're actually the designers. It means also disciplining ourselves that we are building with what we have and what we can do. Um, so we, we, this was the core. What are we trying to achieve? So we set these three goals and we went by reverse engineering the rating system. Uh, the architecture and construction, I don't want to go through the list, but one of the key components that we had was to uh, build using a particular stone that has excellent thermal quality, as opposed to digging on site and excavating the sandstone, which would be cheaper, because we wanted to have quite thin walls um, to allow uh, to allow the cooling aspect of it. We were designing for cooling, you know, non-mechanical aided cooling, uh, and that's where we put all our efforts with the orientation. We increased that, you know, continuing the slab the ceiling slab becomes the shading across. We raised, the entire project has, was raised 30 centimeters above ground as if it's on a pavement, the whole thing. Um, and we, we had to um, protect uh, the soil underneath, to protect the foundations because it's a clay-based um, soil, which means that, you know, a little bit of rain and this whole building can potentially lift and you get all the damages and this was seen all around us so uh using the the materials uh we designed with green principles that we reduce ac we reduce energy we have black and gray water segregation composting on site the construction waste went into local landfills etc um and we achieved pretty good results with with what we were working with because we didn't have the constraints of does this look good so around this area normally what you have especially in in uh, parts of uh, egypt and many parts is that we tend to use domes domes were wonderful um, ways of cooling spaces and everything but then the domes you end up having very thick walls um so we took a very open-minded approach as to the as to keep it quite contemporary to keep it very simple and non-invasive in the site it kind of blends in but to use certain elements of color as well to reflect and draw in temperatures to achieve that basically after the second audit that we've now achieved there's almost 10 degrees it's almost 10 degrees cooler inside the rooms than it is outside so that is an answer to the complete discomfort that the farm workers uh, suffer from. Um, and we and we were working towards that. That was the number one target for all of us. So like Yuta saying, it's it's not it's gathering everyone to 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 have a goal and work together to to achieving it. Thank you. One of the takeaways that we're, we're, I'm, I'm getting now is a sense that there has to be collaboration and it seems that you need to have the process itself requires people to collaborate from early on so you can learn from each other and, and basically um, synthesize and align what you're learning and what you're getting to know. Tony, do you want to add in one, uh, and, um, actually delve into the weeds of, of what you did specifically with regards to your project? Yeah, um, I've cheated here. I've put two slides. I thought I was being the third one because I wanted to focus on, on um, really about the process behind uh, what actually we we, we use in, in the project. So um, that's what I also like about like the certification process of Graham. It was not more about it was more about process based, um, and I really enjoyed um, working with this tool. Uh, because you provide a great framework to be able to to have a sustainable urban planning system um, uh, in place. So we did quite a few studies actually before we even um, 
put uh, pen to paper or thinking of what we need to do. And a lot of it also is really much about, um, like Sarah said, uh, like a people-centered uh, design. So there are lots of consultations and stakeholders engagement, economic, social economic studies, um, dem demographic needs and profile analysis to really understand um, the, the landscape or like the social landscape. And then how to integrate such a big project uh, in existing uh, contexts and uh, conservation. Um, so yeah, that was great. And then we did quite a few other things and think about energy strategy, uh, water strategy, etc., which is um, which was also like a big service. Um, um, yeah. So so yeah, I wanted to to really. Um, stress about the importance of, of mainly when we do pre mill certification but we just don't do tick box exercise but it's more about an integrated approach to design really about four processes about enough information to make the final decision next slide please yeah so the first thing which was uh, when we talk about first, which was very easy to, to get uh, going, was the sustainable brain drainage system. So this is one key thing about, about the project where we use like retention ponds, we use nature to do the stormwater drainage. It was a um, a bit of a difficult thing because uh, there are always already planning planning policy guidelines regarding drains, etc. So you need to have X amount of drains to do because it's just conventional drainage. You need to have white drains all directing the water somewhere. And now we come in with some approaches that's never been used before, where you actually don't have drains all that much drain. So this is like a winner for all the neighborhood development increasing projects where we have sustainable urban drainage system when you use nature and landscaping, uh, et cetera, to do the drainage. Obviously, the big thing about smart cities, the work, live and play, uh, this is the whole thing. Um, there's been a big focus on cycling, pedestrian, pedestrian access, um, placemaking, this was very uh, prominent uh, in the project because that's what we're selling the lifestyle of not having to use a car or having to can walk anywhere with that like, nice landscape there was also a solar farm which was upside uh, to, which would which would, would um, provide some renewable energy to the grid and this was a great project also um, financially also and then the other thing was uh, to have some green development guidelines for all the property developers. So basically, we, these are the, the, the key things that were included in the design. Obviously, taking into consideration uh, the needs of uh, our nearby villages, where they wanted jobs, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, what type of facilities, amenities, and also the wish of not having like a gated estate as we know it because we a lot of time we tend to to just gate a space because this is the difference between income classes uh this was very open and um yeah so so this is about the, the montresor project but i must say it was not very easy also to have a lot of these things mainly the green development uh, uh, guidelines for developers because uh, there, there are uh, constraints for developers to add things that might cost them some money. So when they compare with competitors, they're a bit worried, but they, like for Freeport, for example, there's an airport company of Mauritius, uh, they're also doing a Freeport, and they didn't have any uh, constraint and, and limitations about development guidelines. So it was a bit of a difficult sell also to the client to, to have a rigorous uh, sustainable design, green building, uh, development guidelines. Thank you. Excellent, Ray. Thank you so much for that. Okay, it's my turn. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay, very quickly, I'm going to run through some of the uh, green credentials of the, um, of the MasterCard um, fit out. The one thing that is quite important to note, because this was a Green Star project, um, and uh, in terms of the way the Green Building Council uh, works with uh, countries where there is no um, Green Star tool, 
we work with local context reports. So we had drafted a local context report already um, for uh, for Green Star and Terrace for Nigeria on the back of another project we had done with Unilever. Um, also their office fit out um, just prior to that. Um, the important thing was that, uh, so this obviously set the whole framework for everything that we were doing. The materials, um, you know, com component, which is a major part of the interiors fit out, as you can imagine. Um, you know, everything was imported, carpets, flooring, furniture, assemblies, paints, coatings, sealants, everything was imported. So that was fairly easily achieved in line with Green Star. To, if you just move to the next slide quickly, I just, I, I will run through the, um, the next one. Can I have the next slide, please? Okay, so I just want to just high level, um, I, I will get to that picture just now, um, the, why it's there. Um, so just to say what we've done, we did obviously focus quite, focus quite a bit on the, on the process itself, construction waste management and environmental management doing construction, uh, developing documentation plans, and then working with the contractors. In terms of the fit out itself, there were um, a lot of in indoor plants where we actually exceeded requirements, which is again also part of the client requirement. Um, occupancy sensors were installed, which were linked to BMS, CO2 sensors, daylight sensors, general lighting, and HVAC sensors. Submetering was also installed, um, both for, for electrical as well as water, which was quite an interest, the water was quite an interesting component because this building gets its water, all its water from, from a borehole, a treated uh, water from a borehole. Um, and uh, the, the tenant in this particular case is not being charged for the water, which for us was quite an interesting um, um, dilemma in a, in a way to kind of understand, you know, how do you, if, you, if, if, there's, if the resource is not valued in itself or, or financially valued, how do you actually, how, how, you know, where do you put the incentives in to, to, to save water, certainly in, a, in, a, in an office environment? Um, then we, we, we know obviously as specified energy efficiency appliances, zero ozone depleting potential refrigerants in, in the HVAC uh, that was under, under tenant control, and of course also zero ODP and insulins. Um, and then the one, I uh, just wanted to quickly chat about this one image here, and it's the black SUVs. And because we, and this is the one thing when, when we often, uh, when we go on site and we asked about green building, people said we don't want bicycle racks. And, and bicycle Bicycle racks are often the laughing stock of a, of, a, of a green building, of a green interior, since we don't want bicycle racks. And no, in this particular case, um, I think Lagos uh, being possibly being still, maybe a, it, it would have been a bit, bit of a push to, to install bicycle racks um, and to be used. So, but because this was the image that we had um, from the from the um, from the client to say this is what happens in this building with all the black SUVs parked in the basement, there is no one is coming to work on a bicycle. Um, so this, this is a, <laughs> hence this image. But there was alternative uh, parking for uh, carpooling provided, which which uh, which we then uh, used for um, for the transport category. But again, it's around the whole um, you know obviously adapting the tools to their particular um, you know. A, a locality, um, you know, in the overall the local context. Yeah. So this is this is all from us. Great, wonderful. Thank you so much. I really appreciate all that, and we've gone into quite some detail. Our last time is uh, sort of marching on, and we need to sort of speed ahead slightly. So we are going to basically skip the last part and go on to some questions. And if you would. Um, Basically, look, I'll just uh, consult the questions that have come up here. So, first question that is from uh, Mohammed Mansour, who is our you know, head of MENA, World Green Building Council. Um, and the question is what, what would each of you um, give to, what advice would you give to prospective sustainable consultants hoping to bring, break into the green design scene? Right? Um, What's the best way to get the word out there to clients? What's the best way to engage with them? What's the best way to, you know? Very quickly, starting with you, Ty. This is you advising 20-year-old <laughs> you starting out. What would you need to know? <laughs> I, I think, that, well, it, it, if I was had to start again, I would start exactly where I started and it's actually in the deep end. Um, be part of a project team, uh, be, um, and uh, or try and get become part of a project team and and not be afraid to um, to ask questions. 
all along. I think this would be, if I started there again, I would start exactly there once more. Excellent. Thank you very much. Sarah, what would be your input on that, on that question? I would, um, I mean, I, I need advice myself, but I'm just thinking with the, with the challenges uh, that climate change and livelihood challenges that we see every single day, I think people wanting to go into green buildings and into that value chain should not be apologetic for it. This, these are real problems and they exist and they require solutions. There is no excuse uh, at all um, anymore to to resist this, and I think um, now is the right time. I mean, we started off trying to convince people of doing something that's that's right, and now the movement is is happening. So I'm uh, I would just think that in order to do that, they really have to um, cut down the barriers of cost a little more. Um, and localize everything so that it's accessible it's more accessible it's not just very very expensive and very elite uh it's more mainstream okay thank you very much for that um i have another question which actually maybe if i can um scoot on to the next question and then have you answer all of that basically it says um did you apply any circular economy principles in your sustainable built environment projects Clearly, the person that the, the person asking says, I picked up some of the project, some of the elements in the project in Egypt, um, and are interested in, in in hearing what you know. In summary, um, was applied in 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 Lagos. What was applied um, in Montresor? I think they were there, but maybe you could just run us through very briefly. Did you? Go out. Well, obviously, circular, circularity is, is an element that you, you'd be looking at. But what, in particular, did you um, focus on? How did you go about it? Uta, please. Um, and on, on on this particular project, we did not apply any kind of circularity principles. Let's let's be this. This we followed very much the guidelines of the. Um, um, this was not really part of our um, our our. our challenge or not not at least not on this particular project no the 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 one thing that we did though and that is i think that's uh it's probably just that's more going in that direction where we what we developed was a um a tool for um for for a materials tool that yeah this particular um that's where we can actually assess a um a material uh, from you know, really through a take, well, really by taking a, a, um, a circular economy, a circular life and a life cycle analysis um, approach by looking at everything from you know a sourcing, emissions, disclosure, and then product and end of life and disposal plans, and really allowing those those kinds of materials, really allowing this really much more within you know looking at at local materials that may not have um, a global standard which is often very very expensive to 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 obtain but to really look at materials in themselves from a from from an lca perspective and use that calculator that we developed for this project yeah this is what we have done maybe that's I'm not sure whether that answers your question but and um, tony did you have anything that you did in particular that you felt uh, or that you feel would be uh, good to share yeah um, i think it's the the sort of entry point circular economy, which is more about waste minimization and waste recycling. So in the project, there was lots of demolition and we had to, to re, we had, uh, they re reuse it. Um, and also there are lots of excavation with rocks uh, that's been reused on site. So I think these are the two big ones about uh, reuse of uh, demolition material and also you uh, have excavated rocks. And um, there were also um, regarding recycling of uh, black water. Uh, this was proven a bit of difficulty because of phased uh, approach. So, because we didn't want to invest in a plant, and but then the development doesn't go as far um, as because then the plant also won't work. So that was a bit of a of a problem. Um, yeah. Okay, there's a whole ton of questions here, which I think we might have to, if you run out of time, we'll probably have to share with you afterwards. But for instance, there's a question like, how did you manage to save water on the Lagos project? That is one. Um, that is for Uta and Sarah, is how on cost were these projects? This is another one that came up. That was for um, 
how how far were you able to keep within the you know the, the, the parameters of your costing for the project? That is for all of you. Yeah, so the yeah, so the parameters of the cost by localizing the material and the labor, we cut down on the huge transport issue. Um, and that also gave us the capability to cut down on the construction time because it was localized as well. So that was the first thing. The second thing is the energy uh, component of the building. This is, you know, using how the building preserves energy and doesn't waste energy and then having the building solar powered as well was uh, one of the huge components that saved us a lot of money because um, otherwise the other option is to have um, diesel which is brought into the construction site uh, also transported onto construction sites um, the idea of saving on material if it's not doing something it shouldn't be there uh, was also and uh, you know material based saving um, another thing partnerships local partnerships with you know um, furniture makers with fittings with fixtures even down to the artwork so we had a lot of um, partnerships with smaller startups and local startups um, to avoid importing uh, you know within um, governance and governance and within also uh, to avoid importing as much as possible. The cost of the construction of the village with its energy farm is the same as a conventional building without its energy that will pay in the running cost conventional electricity. So uh, they had to see it this way. They had to see the project life cycle properly and we did that. So it, it became cheaper. That's why it's it 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 resonated because it became cheaper. So we cracked that misconception. Um, uh, but it's how. interesting. If I, we have a we have a whole host of questions. One that deals with the issue of importation and as as opposed to uh, as aligned with green. How do you have a green uh, project when you've imported everything that was I think was for Utah but for anybody who has submitted a question and um, does not get a response in the time allowed please feel free to um, you know message to send your message or, or, or send it on to africa at worldgbc.org and uh, we will submit them to our uh, panelists and each will respond to you but um, yeah, the, the question about how do you, you know, claim a green project if you have to import all your things. And for Tony, there's one in particular that talks about how do you implement the green smart city concept at a large scale? And, uh, you know, what are, what are the levers of success? So in Can super I... speed time, oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> super speed time. Um, okay, obviously the, um, the, Green is not just about being local. Of course, this, this will be preferred to be local, but green is certainly on this particular project was really around the environmental um, uh, attributes of the materials from a from an indoor um, environmental quality perspective, from a health perspective, from a recycled content perspective. Uh, you know, if it's uh, if you know you can if you have a project a product that is um, is locally made but has very high emissions it's also not a green project. So you can absolutely have a project with important materials um, that is considered green. The other, the other side of that is, of, of course, it's not just about the materials that go in, but also how you're setting up your, your interior space for energy savings and water savings and a healthy indoor um, uh, environmental quality in the, you know, for operations. And that's obviously, that's the, that's the other part uh, projects are not just about materials there are systems there how everything fits together that's definitely how i can um we would have preferred a, um, local materials that meet all the environmental criteria but that's that was just simply not possible for this particular project excellent thank you so much for that question tony do you want to have a quick uh, bash at yeah. answering your question in less than a minute Okay, um, yeah, with difficulty, I think green and smart and large scale is very difficult because uh, uh, basically you need to do infrastructure first, and this is very costly, and investors don't actually see the returns until they sell the first building or we build the first building. So it's very tricky actually to include um, some of the technologies because um, yeah, they want to do the bare minimum because money is scarce and investors want to return very quickly. Uh, so
It's a bit of a tricky thing, and uh, mainly very smart cities in Mauritius, given the fiscal incentive, the government, uh, the onus is on the proper, private property developer to, to develop. So it's not actually the city who will put all the different infrastructure. Yeah, so I can't, I think uh, for like for green building, like for, for green uh, neighborhood development, um, look out for the low, low hanging fruits, things that doesn't cost a lot of money. Um, yeah, I think. I mean, I can do that. But thank you so much to absolutely everybody. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much for your, your project and sharing your knowledge and uh, your experience and uh, making this such a pleasurable and uh, knowledge building platform. Thank you very, very much to Yuta. Thank you very much to Sarah, Tony, and uh, above all, thank you to our listeners. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. We're going to have to sort of thank end you. it there. Anybody who has had uh, their question answered please do submit it to africa at uh, worldgbc.org and uh, thank you very much and have a good evening thank you thank you goodbye thank, thank you, you. Bye. thank you bye